All right. So we've learned about graphical methods. Um, and the reason we're teaching you graphical methods, even though as I was able to, as we showed in the last um, video, they're not, sometimes they're not terribly accurate is because they're very useful for figuring out um, in a rough way, the behavior of an optical system. So let's, let's look at this optical system here and let's practice um, the graphical method. We have uh, L1, um, we have L1, which is a negative lens. Um, and we have L2, which is a positive lens. Both have the same focal length, 50 millimeters, and they're located this distance apart, right? The neat thing about the graphical method is, is everything should be to scale, right? Um, and here is our point source, P1. So uh, again, we're going to um, use red for the first lens and then blue for the second lens. Because the first lens is gonna create a, um, an image and we're gonna use that image as the point source object for the second lens. Okay, so here's our point source object. Um, our first uh, task is um, a ray, because this is a negative lens, so remember everything's kind of flipped from the positive lens. We have a ray that travels parallel to the optical axis, is gonna appear to come from the focal point on the, on the left-hand side of the lens. A ray that travels through the center of the lens travels unmolested through that, un, unchanged through the lens, so it goes straight. And finally, um, a, uh, a ray that passes through the last, uh, the right side focal point ends up traveling parallel to the optical axis after it leaves. Cool. So. Um, if we translate this parallel beam backwards, we see that it hits this intersection point right here. And so there's a lot of rays here and a lot of things going on. But if we look, they're right here. Oops, I'm still have, still in my line line mode. Right here, oh God, I missed. Right here, um, all three rays intersect. This ray, this ray and this ray all intersect right here. And that point is going to be our image one. So that is a imaginary image. And the reason it's imaginary is if I put a piece of paper there, um, it's not gonna have a bright spot on it. And the reason is, is because the actual path of these rays is to travel like this. So the top ray goes straight, hits our diverging lens and starts diverging, it goes out. Um, this ray that goes through the center of the lens, remember it doesn't get changed, so it keeps going out. And then this ray, which passes from this point source to here, starts traveling parallel to the, to the beam. So if we put a piece of paper here, let's make it purple, um, all we'll see is a fuzzy round, uh, a fuzzy round circle. Um, we will not see uh, a bright point of light. So it's an imaginary image and it is also upright. And the reason it is upright um, is because it's on the same side of the optical axis as our object. So our image and our object are on the same side of the optical axis. Um, again, if we were to look at this with our eyes, so if we put our eyes like here, for example, and we were to look at this, we would see a point source right here at I1 with our eye. Um, we would not, uh, a point source of light there, we would see that image with our eye. Um, and the important part is, is why it's called an upright image is when this rises up, if this point source were to move up, this image would also rise up, uh, by, but by a different amount. And the amount that it rises up is related to the magnification, which if this is L1 and this is L2, then the magnification is equal to um, L2 over 
L1. Great, so um, we have our new point source and now we're gonna, um, our, we have our image and we're gonna turn that into a point source now for our next lens. And our next lens is L2 and it's positive. We're gonna use blue now. And so um, now, Again, all these lines are gonna start overlapping and it's gonna get a little confusing, but um, I think we'll be okay. So let's travel, oops, I don't know why I'm trying to do this by freehand, that's annoying. Let's undo that, let's do the line here. So our first task is to go parallel beam, parallel to the optical axis. Now for a positive lens, this parallel beam goes through the focal point on the opposite side of the lens. So this goes down like this, it converges. Um, our next beam that we're going to try to draw is going to be through the focal point on um, the same side of the lens. And this one, once it goes through that focal point and hits the lens, starts going parallel to the, to the optical axis. And finally, we have one more ray, which is one that passes through the center of the lens and it passes through um, un, unchanged. And so we can see that all of our rays intersect right here, right here. We have what we would call I2, image two. Now image two, if this is our object for our second lens, is on the opposite side of our optical axis. So it is a real image. If we were to put a piece of paper right here, we would see a bright point of light. Um, and also if we put our eyes, put an eye right here, um, we would see a point of light right here. Um, yeah, uh, so this is I2, it's a real image and it's inverted. And for our entire uh, optical system, we can also look at that. We have this image for our entire optical system is also real and inverted, right? Because here's our object, it's on the opposite side of our optical axis than our original object is on the opposite side of our optical axis than our image. Cool, so um, you can start to see some of the disadvantages of the graphical system with this example, mostly because um, uh, when you have really shallow rays like this, the, it becomes very difficult to uh, um, figure out exactly where they intersect with high accuracy, right? A little bit of error in the height of one of these rays is gonna cause a large change in the location of where this uh, intersection is. So um, yeah, so there are disadvantages, but the nice part is, is it becomes very easy to figure out which lens um, limits the light of the optical system the most, right? Um, so uh, in this case, what we're curious about is we're curious, uh, each of these lenses has a finite diameter. So um, these lenses will block light that comes through them. And our question is, is, is how much light do they block, right? So now that we know where the image is from the first lens, we can actually draw some, um, draw some rays. And I'm gonna actually, oh, by the way, um, so uh, now that we know where the image is for the second lens, we can actually continue these two red rays here and let's continue them because we know that they go through the image like this and like this. So the rays, these actual rays of light continue through here and they come down through this image. Once we know where the, the image point is, we can do that. Um, so let's, let's pick purple now, and hopefully this won't get too confusing. Uh, let's look at the, the widest angle of rays that go through this um, uh, first lens. And we see that these rays are, um, come here and they hit the outside of this lens right like this. And when, after they leave this lens, remember that they appear to have come from a point source located at 
the image. So we can actually just draw a straight line through where they hit the lens coming from the image. And that is the path that they'll take. So uh, a cone of light comes from point one. It, the, the cone of light has this, oh shoot, stop that, stop being there. Has this uh, um, span, if you will. And then it hits this diverging lens and surprise, surprise, it diverges and starts spreading out even more. And um, it, what's pretty clear is that these lens, these rays do not hit do not even hit lens two, right? Um, in fact, the uh, the only rays that hit lens two are ones that travel from the outside of lens two to our point source. So we can actually translate these back. So we have one here and we have one here. And then we know that when they hit the lens, they actually go back to our object. So the rays that get collected by the second lens and sent to our point source are actually only this amount right here. This amount right here. Cool. So this is why the graphical method is so useful. We use the three rules in order to determine where our images are. And then once we know where the images are, we know that rays appear to come from those images that leave the lens. And so that makes it very easy to draw the rays that um, the rays of our system and figure out things like which one of these is the aperture stop. And that's a that's a that's a key word here. Aperture stop. That is the 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 object in your system that limits the the most limits the rays that pass through it, right? So in this case, our lens two limits the uh, cone of rays that are actually collected. If we wanted to increase the amount of rays that we are collecting, we would have to increase the size of L2 significantly. Cool, so um, the answer to this then is L2. Great, we have a second, uh, We have a second um, object and lens system here. So let's label these really quick. This is, uh, I'm gonna switch to the, so this is F1, F1, F2, F2. Um, so if we go back to layer three, so what we can see is that we have a small lens with a high, um, a short focal length here for L2. Let's label it L2. This is L1 and we don't know what the, um, focal length is, excuse me, but the nice part about this graphical me method is we don't actually have to know the focal length once we have everything drawn out. Um, so we've drawn everything to scale here, the, the height of our lens, the focal points, um, and now we have a point source. And what's interesting about this point source is that it is inside of F1. Everything we've dealt with so far has had the, the point source out here, P1 on the far side of F1 from our lens. And now we're inside of it. And we're gonna see how that affects things. So um, yeah, let's do it. Okay, so uh, red light for the first lens, blue lines for the second lens. So our rules are for a positive lens, if we have a parallel beam of light coming from our, um, coming from our point source, like that, then that parallel beam of light will go through F1 on the far side. So we're gonna draw that like this. And then we have our second rule, which is light traveling through the center of the lens uh, does not uh, change directions. And our third rule is um, light traveling from the point source to F1 uh, travels in a straight line after the lens. So we're gonna draw a line here 
and then draw a straight line here. And so what's interesting about this is none of these intersect on the right-hand side of the lens. In fact, if we draw, if we continue these lines backwards, right, Well, they uh, continue these lines backwards. I'm gonna go way back here. And here I've drawn them <laughs> a little funky. Uh, this is this is where uh, this is where your ability to to be accurate really matters. Um, technically, they these rays should all intersect in the same spot, and we're gonna pick that. That's intersection spot as, see, um, right here. So uh, this point right here. Okay, so this is uh, our image, image one, I1. And now here's an interesting question. We have a positive lens, but the image has occurred on the left-hand side of the lens, right? On the far side of the lens. And that tells us that our image is actually imaginary. And it is upright. So if we move P1 up, I1 will also move up. It moves in the same direction because it is an upright image. And if we were to place a, a, an I, somewhere over here, the all-seeing eye, it would actually see a point source of light where I1 is. Um, because what the lens does is it moves the, our object, P1, essentially to I1. Pretty cool. All right. Um, oh, I see now why this didn't quite work. I'm going to, I'm getting, I'm a little, we didn't draw this line very well. So I'm going to erase it and redraw it more correctly. Um, it should go through the point source and oh, it should go through the point source and then it should also go through the origin. And then if we draw extend that backwards, well, still doesn't intersect, but it's much closer. Um, yeah, so anyway, again, problem with the graphical methods, if you don't have everything laid out perfectly, you're not going to get a good clean intersection point there. And I did not do a good job of laying this out. So, but we do have our image one, which is roughly right here. And it's still quite useful um, for determining the properties of the system as we'll see. So now we have, we're going to pretend that our I1 is our P1, P2 our point source or our object for our lens two. And we're gonna apply the rules again, this time with in blue. So, oh, well, before we go, it's always good to trace the, the actual path of rays, right? Because we have all these lines going on the screen now. So a, if a light comes from P1 in this direction, it's gonna hit our lens and get trans, uh, translated this way. If a light goes parallel, it's gonna hit our lens and be translated this way. And finally, this ray is gonna come through our center and go this way. And so that what we see is if our point source is inside of our focal point, if it's um, between our focal point and our lens, we now, uh, instead of creating a converging um, set of rays, our positive lens produces a diverging set of rays. These are all spreading out now. Uh, ray one, two, and three are all spreading out and it produces an imaginary upright image. Um, as before, most of these rays are not actually going to hit our lens too, right? So we need to draw now um, new lines given I1 through I through lens two um, using our rules. And these are now the rules we practice. They're not funky this time because we're on the far side of F2. So we're on this side of F2, so it should be fairly straightforward. So we're going to start at I1, draw a line straight through the middle of the lens, and good, we're done with that one. Now we're gonna draw a line straight through F2, the, the focal point 
um, on, on this side of the lens. Oh, that was bad. I got distracted. Um, a notification came up. Uh, yeah, do F2 on this side of the lens. And when it hits the, uh, hits the, hits the actual lens, it's gonna go parallel to the optical axis. And then we do one final ray, which passes through, uh, hit, I'm oh, sorry, it goes parallel to the optical axis. And when it hits our lens, this is hard because our lens is actually small. It's going to come down through our focal point and come down like this. Um, so oh, actually you can see I've done this wrong, a little bit wrong again. This is a little bit too shifted um, to the left, which is why this one didn't quite hit. If it were shifted a little bit more down, it would be fine and to the right, but it's okay. We know that our image is somewhere in here. I2 is somewhere in here and it is real and uh, in, um, inverted. And overall, our entire system produces a real and inverted um, image. And that is because our point source here is on the positive side of the optical axis and our image is on the negative side. And if we were to move our point source up here, what would happen is our image one would move up, but our I2 second image would move down. And so since it moves in the opposite direction, overall this optical system produces a real and inverted image. Um, and it's not a terribly efficient optical system. It, catches a lot of light rays from the first point source, but most of those do not hit our second lens. And so most of them do not get focused onto our eye too. They just pass harmlessly into nothingness, right? So now that we know where our images are though, we can start answering our bonus question. Which lens limits the field of view the most, right? So what this question is asking is a little bit different. Um, is a little bit different than uh, our previous question. Our previous question was which lens limits the angle of light collected from P1? Um, in this case, we are asking which lens limits the uh, field of view the most. And field of view is defined as if this is our image plane here, this is where our image occurs. How far can we move P1 and still see it over here in our image plane? So P1 is going to move up and I3 is going to move down. But at, what, at some point, I3 is going to disappear because P1 has moved outside of the field of view of our imaging system. So let's, let's play with this a little bit. Um, we know that. Uh, as we move P1 up, right, I1 will go up. And as we move I1 up, we can see that at some point this top ray, let's put I1 here, for example, let's make this I1 prime, let's say. Um, if we draw a ray from I1 prime, let's make it purple because we're being hypothetical here. Through the top of this lens, we can see that it barely gets caught by the second lens. And in fact, if we move I in any other ray that we uh, draw will not get caught oh, by the second lens. Um, if we move this uh, imaginary point source even higher, let's put our I, let's make this, um, call this I double, double prime, I one double prime and draw a new line, right? We try to figure out which ray is the topmost ray that will still pass through L1. So it has to go through L1. So it has to go through the top of that lens. And if we continue it on, that ray doesn't actually even hit our second lens. So 
which lens limits our field of view the most? Well, it turns out it is L2. And the reason is, is because as we move our point source higher, P1 higher, the imaginary upright point source continues to move up, 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 up until the point at which the rays that pass through our original lens um, don't even pass through L2. Now, what might be a little confusing is we're drawing straight lines from our image straight through L1 to L2, right? And it might seem confusing because you're like, well, the lens has to be changing the path. It will change the path if we draw rays from our point source. But um, the nice part about knowing where our image is means we can draw straight lines from our image to L2, right? Um, because if, again, if we put an eye here, it, uh, to this eye, it looks as though P1 is actually at I1 and any rays coming from P1 are actually coming in straight lines from I1. So this is the power of the graphical method. Once we figure out where I1 is, we can just ignore this lens and start drawing lines from it, except for the fact that the lens has a finite height, which means all the rays that we draw from I1 still have to go through L1, our, our lens, first lens. Um, similarly, we could, we could draw a, uh, um, a ray that goes through the bottom of L1 like this, but it's, pretty clear that, that that ray would never even come close to coming through L2, right? It's going so far down, it would never even come close. So the only chance we have of having a ray come from I1 and hit L2 is for um, P1 to be low enough that it can actually make there, which means that this is limiting our field of view. And if we wanted to increase our field of view, what we would do is we'd make L2 bigger. So we'd get a larger diameter lens there, or we'd have to re redesign our whole system. Great, so that was two practice problems for our graphical method. Um, the next thing we're gonna start talking about are some equations that allow us to do similar things. But um, obviously, since they're equations, we have a little bit more flexibility. We can program them um, and we can uh, put them into optimization routines in a way that we can't with the graphical method. All right, now I just gotta figure out how to stop this. <laughs>